on this edition of Around BCC. How safe is the BCC campus? Students and officials talk about how to prepare. We spend some quality time with the college's chief academic officer, and our alumni profile looks at the educational path of a local police chief. Welcome to Around BCC, I'm Keith Tebow. Spring break is over, the weather is warming up, and we're heading toward another successful completion of an academic year here at Bristol Community College. First up this month, the tragedies at Virginia Tech and Northern Illinois Universities proved to be a wake-up call to all of us to be better prepared for emergencies, and BCC is taking a proactive approach. BCC has always had a system-wide plan in place in the event of an emergency. But is the college really safe? At a recent open meeting with students, faculty and staff, college officials outlined some of the details of the institution's preparedness plan. The consensus was that by and large, BCC is a safe campus, but the preparedness plan is always in a state of fluidity. Stephen Ozug, Vice President of Enrollment Services, says it's important to keep the lines of dialogue open to ensure that as many concerns about campus safety as possible are met. I think the days of having an emergency or preparedness plan written and then put on a shelf and forgotten about for five or ten years, I think those days are over for any institution and that you always have to be constantly looking at the plan and updating the plan and making sure the plan is current in terms of where society is at, and where your population, where your constituents are at. We will always have an ever-changing constituent pool, whether that be the faculty, the staff, the students, the community at large that we serve. And because of that, we should constantly be in communication and be in dialogue with them over what do we need to be thinking about? What, what's working? What's not working? What do we need to continue to be on top of? The open meeting was not well attended, but those who were on hand made a point to voice their concerns. Student Kim Gillette says many people were unaware of the forum, and the low turnout was unfortunate, but not unexpected. People don't care. That's the problem with today's society. Is people just don't care. If it doesn't, if it doesn't affect them, it, people don't care. It's just like the war. People don't protest the war. It doesn't affect me until someone they know gets killed, and that's. Unfortunately, what has to happen, it has to knock on your doorstep for people to truly care. Even though the college's preparedness plan is available for viewing by anyone, Gillette remains skeptical about its potential. They're doing a lot of thinking and a lot of talking and no action, which is usually what happens. Um, I think people wait too long to take an action just like with 9-11. No one made a plan until something bad happened. You need to prevent that. So if, God forbid, something does happen on campus, uh, you know, I don't want my life in the hands of some guy I don't know. You know, I don't trust people enough to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to trust the college because they have a plan. I want proof. I want to see it. But that's any person in their right mind wants it in their hands. You know, it has to be attainable. It can't just be, oh, there's a plan. Okay, if someone comes and opens fire, I'm going to trust you. The concern voiced by Gillette is common. The college is always looking at ways to improve how it communicates with its constituents. Vice President of College Communications Sally Cameron says a lot of effort is devoted into using multiple platforms to get information into the hands of those who need or request it. Communication is not me telling you something, but communication is you hearing what I have to say. So one of the things that we've done a lot of discussion and thinking about is how are we going to make sure we're heard? How are we going to make sure that the institution, any message from the institution, good, bad, informational, anything, can, is heard? So we spend a lot of time talking about how we use our website, how we use our publications to communicate effectively. With the website, you can see whether people respond, whether they click on it, whether they do something. So you know you get almost instantaneous feedback. Print, it's a little less so, but when we mail out a course brochure, our registration numbers go up. So there's a direct response. So that's how we know we're heard. 
To further that effort, the college is implementing a new information distribution system called Be Notified, based on the moniker of the college's mascot. Cameron says at the outset, the user-driven Be Notified system will be used to deliver important emergency information. All students email and faculty and staff email will be automatically loaded into Be Notified. And if we have an emergency, that'll be the way that the college will get information to people. But we see with 68% with of our students having text message capability, we are seeing that text messaging is something that people are expecting. They don't go to uh, to email anymore, a lot of traditional age students. So they get their news on, on their cell phone. So we're looking at ways to uh, make channels that people can sign up for. One of the things that I think is really important about preparedness is that you need to draw a circle around yourself and say, how am I prepared? And one of the ways that you can prepare, everybody here on campus at, at all of the three of our sites can prepare, is by signing up for this information. Because this information will be the go-to place for late-breaking emergency sort of information and preparedness information. Cameron says what's great about Be Notified is its potential to deliver general campus news as well. You subscribe to activities, academic information. Um, for activities, we would provide the uh, activities that are going on uh, uh, on the calendar, uh, academic information. We'll, we can remind people about registration, meet with your advisor, all of those things. The thing that's so exciting about the system is that it really is 24-7, really is, you know, on the, on the cusp of information getting out there. So everyone needs to take advantage of it. Student Randy Motoso says getting information from the college has always been a challenge, but the prospect of getting it via text messaging is a good idea. The majority of students have cell phones or are standing next to another student with a cell phone. So if we give them our phone numbers, as long as they're not going to use their phone numbers for anything but that, I think that's fine. That they, I would more than happy give my cell phone number to them. So when there is a problem occurs, that one of my friends or somebody I'm standing next to gets the information out, which I think that's a really good idea that they put forth. You can sign up for the Be Notified system right now. Log on to the college's website at bristolcc.edu and follow the Be Notified link. Time for our in-depth segment here at Around BCC. You know, there are a lot of people here at the college who do a lot of good work that go unnoticed. Well, we at Around BCC, we're not going to let them be unnoticed for too long. Today we're going to talk a lot about the academic area of Bristol Community College. And my guest for our in-depth segment this month is Dr. Sarah Garrett. She is the Vice President of Academic Affairs, which by and large means she's the Chief Academic Officer here on campus. Thank you for joining us. Sarah. Thank you for having me. Dr. Garrett, first of all, what is, for people who don't know, what is the Vice President of Academic Affairs? What, what do you do? And I know that's probably a big general question <laughs> that will probably take all our time, but if you could just summarize for us what your role here is at BCC. I think that my primary role is to uh, ensure that all of the academic programming um, is responsive to the needs of the community. I work directly with the faculty in um, making sure that we achieve our mission and vision of the College of Changing the Lives of, of our students, learner by learner. Mm -hmm. And I know that some will say, oh, that's just cliche, but it's what we really believe in. And so as the Chief Academic Officer, it's my um, duty to make sure that we have programs that are academically sound, programs that are connected to careers that are central to this community, the immediate community, and then of course the global community. And that all of the academic support services are such that help students um, on a quicker and smoother pathway to success. Now, you, in, in your role, you oversee just about everything that happens on this campus yes. in terms of classroom instructions, faculty, 
So, so I mean, you're, you've got a big hat to wear in terms of what, what your role here is yes. at, at BCC. You've been here now for almost a year. Um, what have you liked about BCC? What have been some of the challenges, other than you know, learning the, the system and learning mm -hmm. a, a, a new role? I think what I have um, loved the most about BCC um, is the fact that we have such dedicated faculty. Uh, people who are here because they truly want to make a difference in the lives of the students. That's everything and that makes my job so much easier because when I sit down with the deans of the six academic divisions and I talk to them about program development, the first thing that we have to do is to bring other faculty in and to the table and the excitement that they have when you discuss with them how we can take what we have that's already excellent mm -hmm. and, and build it to make it even better. The light bulbs go off in their eyes because they know that what I'm trying to do is to help them, to empower them to do their jobs even better. So having the, the faculty that are there to work with me as a team, because you said it is a big job, but I can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. And to have such expert faculty, we have faculty who have published in every venue throughout the country, and um, faculty who work directly in the community. Um, our theater, uh, Rylan Brenner, he's just absolutely phenomenal. Um, when you look at uh, individuals in our business division who are working with the banking industry, that's incredible. Our nursing faculty and what they're able to do to support the needs of the healthcare community and our dental clinic and it just goes on and on. Um, the writing uh, support that students get through our English uh, department, um, our science and technology, engineering, um, it's just these are such great academic programs that allows me to look at how I can uh, work with the faculty to expand upon what we already have mm -hmm. and or to when it comes to technology to work with the, the dean and the faculty of that division to make sure that we stay current in what we're producing we're looking at gaming and, and other types of, of um, uh, technologically sound and, and vibrant programs. Let me get into that for a moment. How difficult is it to try to expand what we have here you know, in, in the face of, you know, financial constraints oh, yes. and everything else that a, that a state institution has to yes. deal with. I think um, that is, it, it, when you asked me before about a challenge, I was, uh, that was what I was right. going to mention. It is a great challenge when you're in the face of this, you know, state fiscal constraints. The one thing that we do is we take what we do have and we try to use it in the most efficient manner. And then we look for grant funding for many of the initiatives that we have here. Um, science and technology, many of the STEM disciplines, there are these um, grants that we have great um, uh, um, success with. And, those, and all of these grants help to support the programming that we know is critical. What's really also um, um, critically important for our academic programs are the um, donations that come in. You know, our foundation um, mm -hmm. is, is very strong. That, all of these types of things, we just got a major donation. You know, the Pierce um, monies that came in for our health technologies programs. All of that helps to assist us in a day and age of fiscal constraints. Talk a little bit about yourself. You're not from this area. No. Um, you've been here, as we said, just about a year. How did yes. you get from where you began to BCC? Well, everyone who teases me about my love for the Baltimore Ravens and the Baltimore Oreos, they know I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I, I grew up in Baltimore and, um, and was educated uh, in Baltimore. I, um, I went to Morgan State University. My undergraduate major was in English. I loved to write. I, I later um, took that love for writing to law school. And I went to the University of Maryland Law School. And um, following my brother's lead, my brother was um, 
um, uh, one of the youngest lawyers in the country. He became a lawyer at the age of 21. Wow. I wasn't as young as him. <laughs> and uh, I followed him and worked with um, a civil rights law firm, the Mitchell, Mitchell and Mitchell law firm, uh, Juanita Jackson Mitchell, who actually helped me gain admission into the University of Maryland Law School, was the first African-American woman ever admitted to that law mm -hmm. school. So I was very honored to go and work for her firm. Um, throughout the years uh, following law school, I worked with different law firms in the court systems. And then I um, was very fortunate to be appointed as the executive assistant to the general counsel for the NAACP National when they were still in New York under uh, Dr. Benjamin Lawson Hooks, mm -hmm. who was the CEO, and with the idea in mind that they were going to be moving to Maryland. They're actually their um, national headquarters was 10 minutes from my home where I grew up. But I had to live in New York, which was really wonderful, and I, my job as the executive general counsel was to help um, put together trial teams that would investigate and litigate matters throughout the country. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, that's how I got into teaching because we would, at the site of our national uh, conventions, w it was my job to put together the continuing legal ed seminars, these international seminars for lawyers mm -hmm. throughout the world that would come in, nationally renowned um, civil rights lawyers. And um, in, do in so doing, I also lectured, uh, but I was lecturing to lawyers. From that, I was offered a position at a, a local college in Baltimore in the criminal justice uh, department to teach a criminal intro to criminal justice course and, and then some graduate courses. And what was supposed to start as one, I, I got the bug. Mm -hmm. You and I were talking earlier. Yeah. And uh, I got the bug and I taught um, through its extension program at the Maryland State Penitentiary. And, um, and then later, when I, I uh, left from the NAACP, I started working for Mayor Kurt Schmoke. I was the legislative liaison for the city and his special assistant. And because I, I was already the editor for the National Bar Association, I became the editor for the city's um, newspaper, the Baltimore Progress. Mm -hmm. But I started teaching um, at Anne Arundel Community College in its legal studies department. And what was supposed to be a one semester uh, appointment turned into 11 years. <laughs> I, I loved teaching in the community college. It was so much different than the universities. Mm -hmm. I would always guest lecture for different universities. Uh, the class sizes were smaller. Right. You got to know the students. And just like with civil rights law, you knew you were really making a difference mm. in, in the lives of students. So um, I ended up leaving the law and leaving the mayor's office. I remember coming into his office early one morning before a press conference and telling him that I didn't think I was going to be able to continue with him because I was going to take an additional appointment with Anne Arundel. And that was Mayor Kurt Schmoke and he started chuckling and he said that he was discussing me with his wife, um, Dr. Pat Schmoke, and he said to her, every time Sarah comes in to brief me on issues with the city, she bends her brow and she tells me all the things I need to know. And we always end with me asking her, how are your classes going? And he said, then she just gets this big smile on her face. Mm -hmm. And he said, I wonder when it's going to dawn on her that that's where her heart really is. He said, but I'm going to just keep her here as yeah. long as I can. And that's how it ended up. And then obviously you, you moved on to Connecticut? Yes, um, I was the chief academic officer at Isnunta Community College. I was Prior to that, when I left Anne Arundel, I became the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Baltimore City Community College, and then I was promoted to the Vice President for Learning. That was over credit and non-credit. Mm -hmm. But then the opening came available at his Nuntuck, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the President there is uh, Martha McLeod, and I went to work as its Chief Academic Officer. And then so now I was you're in here. the neighborhood. And now you're here. <laughs> yes. Next spot, Maine? No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. <laughs> Move up the coast. I, I want to spend just a, we only have a few moments left. One of the great things about Bristol Community College, and you mentioned a lot of the great academic programs, mm -hmm. is the core general education uh, yes. that we provide all our students, which is their foundation, yes. not only here but going forward. Yes. The college is looking at how it's, it's providing that general education for students. Yes. What are some of the things that the college is looking at to make that gen ed, if you will, better yes. for all our students? 
Well, one of the things that we want to make sure of as an academic community is that we want to always empower our students to be successful, not just while they're here, but when they go on, whether it's to uh, move straight into a career or to transfer to many of the four-year universities and colleges that we have articulation agreements with. In order to do that, we have to provide them with a firm foundation to make sure that they are the truly educated person. Mm -hmm. And in being an educated person, we, we're looking at all of the competency areas, you know, critical thinking, um, communication, writing, um, multicultural understanding, right. all of those areas, and looking at how individual courses can help students achieve those competencies mm -hmm. and starting the dialogue about the types of of objectives the learning objectives that need to be in infused into courses to make sure that each one of these general education competencies are met mm -hmm. so the faculty have been engaged in uh, <laughs> just a, a myriad of uh, conversations and discussions about those gen ed competencies yeah. that we hope to finalize at the end of the semester and those will be published of course in our catalog. And that is something that I'm sure that um, you know will, will benefit not only um, you know current students but you always have to look ahead because again right. of, of changing of changing right. technologies yes. and, and it all has to come into some sort of cohesive mixture so yes. that again it, it comes down to the students and, and their success. Has the college looked at, at, at these gen ed competencies before? Oh was, yes. It, you, there's I know it's always a constant but... Periodic reviews as a matter of fact within um, probably under three to five years we'll be doing it again right. because we always want to make sure that we are moving with the times. It's like technology became you know a real focus in the 90s and um, we want to make sure that we keep our students prepared for the global world. Well Dr. Garrett you have a big job you've done a good job in your first year and, we, and, and all the best and thank you for joining us. Thank today. you so much. Coming up next on Around BCC we have our next installment of Alumni in Your Community. This month we take a look at a local man who has used BCC to become a police chief in one of our local communities. My name is George Arruder. I'm the police chief for the town of Swansea, and I am a class of 1986 at Bristol Community College. When I was growing up in the town of Swansea, my father was a policeman in the town of Swansea, and as I got older, I got interested in law enforcement after meeting a lot of the uh, professionals that he worked with. After graduating from uh, high school, uh, I applied for the criminal justice program at BCC, and uh, I went to BCC. Being young, I went to uh, Bristol Community College when I was 18 years old. Um, if I had, uh, if there's anything I thought, I thought it was going to be a little easier coming from high school and going to Bristol Community College. What I found out is the teachers were very demanding. Um, you had to do a lot of independent work yourself. Um, but on top of it, the professors that I had, if they saw that you had the passion to learn, they were there and they would facilitate it. And uh, I have to say, I've been to three different uh, colleges. My experiences at uh, Bristol were by far the best. After Bristol Community College, uh, and for me to develop and evolve as a police professional, I made a determination that I had to go back to school. So subsequently, I went back to school. Uh, I applied and attended Roger Williams University. Uh, I obtained a bachelor's degree from there. And after that, I went for a master's degree. Uh, in uh, administration of justice and uh, received a master's at Anna Maria College out of Paxton, Mass. I would not be the chief of police if I didn't have the foundation that Bristol Community College gave me. That is the education that started me in my, uh, my years when I went for a four-year degree and when I went for my master's degree. I would not be where I am um, because professional police chiefs nowadays, you, you, have to have, uh, you have to have a minimum of a master's degree. In May of 1982, I became a, a full-time police officer for the town of Tiverton. I started as a patrolman, 
I was a patrolman till 1987, February of 87. I got promoted to a detective inspector. And in February of 1983, I went through the promotional process and I became a lieutenant, um, second in charge of the police department. Um, and then in July of 1996, uh, my chief reti retired and um, the town administrator asked me to be the acting chief. So I was the acting chief. They went through a search and subsequently I was appointed in February of uh, 1997 to be the chief of police for the town of Tiverton. The end of 2002, I, I saw um, that Swansea was uh, doing a search for a police chief. They needed a police chief. Uh, I submitted a uh, resume, went through an interview process, uh, and subsequently was appointed uh, the police chief. Uh, and my first day in Swansea was April Fool's Day of 2003. Uh, at that time, uh, the town was going through a major uh, financial crisis. The police department had uh, been cut uh, 350000 almost $350,000. Um, so it was, it was a difficult time here. Approximately five years ago, um, I approached uh, Ray LaVirtue, who was a dean, spoke with him and met with him and told him that I had, uh, was very interested in going back and um, see if I could mentor, teach, guide, assist uh, uh, young people who may want to get into into this profession. Um, he asked me to submit a, a resume and subsequently uh, hired me to teach uh, Introduction to Criminal Law in the fall and in the winter I teach a class uh, Law Enforcement Management. Part of my job not only as a police chief and an adjunct professor at uh, Bristol Community College uh, is to help mold, educate, mentor, uh, bring forth a lot of my professional experiences not only uh, um, what I've learned being on the other side and listening to people, but also to, to be straight with them and, and so that they have uh, a realism uh, what is out there in this world and what this profession is expecting uh, from them um, and what the public uh, expects. We're public servants. We only derive our power and authority from the people uh, that we represent and that we serve um, and, and also uh, a lot of our profession is not such as uh, you see on TV. Uh, sometimes this can be a very difficult, difficult profession. You can be, and you can feel alone sometimes. It's been one of the highlights of my career to come back uh, and work in this community and give back to a community because who, who I am as a person, there are a lot of school teachers, uh, coaches, citizens that help build me as a human being and it's great to come back and serve um, and, and to do a professional job um, as, a, as a police chief. Every day uh, we learn new things in this profession. Um, every day you have the uh, opportunities um, to help people, whether you're helping someone uh, as, uh, who's having difficulties personally or helping somebody by keeping them safe, uh, arresting somebody who may be victimizing them, um, it's a, this is a great, great profession. That'll do it for Around BCC this month. I'm Keith Tebow. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Joe. Steven. Eric, over here. I'll take him right there. <laughs> All right, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.